But yet the left wants to misrepresent this because they can't comprehend this. This is the facts of the matter. Our current Kentucky governor wanted government violence against Christians who went to church on Easter. You can dress it up however you want to do it. You can try to tie little bows on it. But that is what the courts found. That is what he did. He is wrong to have done it. He, you can't get over that. You can pretend it didn't happen. But that's what happened. And if you want to endorse that, that makes you just as a horrible of a person as he is. And welcome, everybody, to another amazing episode of the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooper Writer. I thank you all for joining me so much today. We've got some stories to cover. Uh, first, we're going to cover the um, vid memorial. As you all know, I, I don't know what the rules are on, on the Facebooks and other social medias as far as downplaying videos that say some words that aren't allowed. So we're going to call it the vid. But the vid memorial, the, the, the uh, panty memorial unveiled. Um, we're going to take a look at that and talk about the collectivism mindset. What Bashir's really trying to unroll with this campaign and with that too we're going to talk about Bashir's already been running ads we showed you that ad uh, he's also uh, been running some attack ads on Cameron already or you know pack has been whatever you want to call it but um, has already been rolling out some attack ads so we're going to take a look at that uh, Kelly Craft releases a stay tuned video indicating there may be a political future uh, for her that she believes she has something um something maybe in the works in the future. We'll talk about what that may be uh, and, and you know, may take a, a closer look at her candidacy, uh, her election during the governor's race as well. And then finally, we'll end with our weekly segment of what did I do to upset the left this week? And let me tell you, this one's a doozy. Uh, cold, hard truth hits some, hits some leftists in Kentucky in the face and they can't handle it. So thank you all so much for joining us. Once again, please like, comment, share, subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to get into it with some of these lefties on these posts. It's at KY Cooper Rider on Twitter, at K-Y-C-O-O-P-E-R-R-I-D-E-R, KY Cooper Rider. Um, obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. If you're listening to this, uh, or watching as a replay on Facebook or YouTube. You can catch the audio-only version on any major podcasting platform. Without further ado, let's dig into the stories of this week. So for our first story, we have this. The uh, vid memorial has been unveiled. Um, for those listening to the audio-only version, I'll, I'll describe it to you. For those on video, we're throwing up a picture, obviously, for you to see. But uh, basically, what you have is a uh, shiny ball sitting on top of a um, altar of some sort, a tall pillar. Uh, in that tall pillar, some people are carved into it. Um, and then around the outside, you have some some kind of featureless people um, holding these these globes. And and from the um, uh, from from the artist's viewpoint, this is their comments. They made those characters standing around it. They're featureless uh, to represent all the people who died. Not one person could represent it, so they made them featureless, and they call it United We Stand, Divided We Fall, and of course, then it has that Team Kentucky plaque. And look, this is uh, a, a classic, make no mistake about it, this is a campaign move by Bashir. For those of you who want to say it's not, you do not understand the very concepts of this kind of collectivism, globalism ideas that literally uh, uh, the Bashir, the Democrats, the far left, rely on in order to convince people to continue to elect them. What do I mean by that? Well, this whole, this whole, even, even the saying, this team Kentucky saying, oh, we're all one big team. In fact, uh, the artist for this said, well, it's to remind everybody we're all one big family. And I'm sorry, we are not one big family. You are not my family. Um, I am not your family, right? If, if my son, if my parents, if my siblings fall on hard times, I open up my door to them uh, just as fine. I adopt different policies to help them out. Out, then I would somebody who's not my family. And that's how you should live your life too. Family does is supposed to mean something important. It means you do anything for them. And, and the 
that mindset of we're a family, that collectivism mindset is exactly the kind of thing they're preying on in order to get you to give up your freedoms, your rights, your responsibilities, but at the same time to give them more power because they're the patriarch. They're, they're, this is Team Kentucky. Bashir's Team Kentucky. Bashir is the, the manager. He's the coach. He's the owner of the team. He's Team Kentucky's leader. And so you give up your control the same way you do on a football team, on a basketball team, on a baseball team. Uh, uh, you know, you don't make the individual decisions. You give it to the coach. You're on a team. And, and in this way, Bashir's that team. You're supposed to give up control over your things to that team leader. And they look at this too. You talk about this on a global school scale on a nationwide scale. I mean, go back in history. Let's look at, uh, right after nine 11. Uh, and this is on the Republican side. You see, uh, Bush coming in and saying, look, you know, we're the USA. We're standing up strong. I'm with you. We are. I'm patriotic too. Um, and then they use that opportunity though, to do things like passing the Patriot Act, which greatly encroached on our constitutional rights and our ability, uh, freedoms and, and to stay away from controls and, and those types of things. And they do the same thing. I mean, this, this isn't just a left versus right thing. This is, I guess you'd call it more collectivism, globalism versus, uh, somebody like me who believes the, uh, smallest minority is the individual. I'm all about individual rights, um, that you don't owe me anything. I don't owe you anything, but that's a very thing Bashir doesn't want you thinking about. He wants you thinking to yourself that we are a collective group, that we are uh, uh, all together. And in order for him to win re-election, well, we can't kick the coach out. We got to keep the coach. We're Team Kentucky. You don't get rid of the coach. You stand behind your coach. And, and anybody who's playing a sports team knows what I'm talking about. And so he's attempting to continue to appeal to the same thing. In fact, you want to talk about globalism. They're literally holding the globes. It represents this idea that everybody, everybody uh, is, is all a part of this. And, and we got to take care of one another. But of course, when you go into that and you secede power, you know, taking care of one another works in very small groups. Why? Because you have accountability. If somebody's not pulling their weight, you have accountability there. You can make decisions better through conversation. But let's remember that this memorial uh, covering the deaths that occurred during 2020, 2021, let's remember that we had Bashir making decisions the entire time without referencing a single other person, pulling another person in a room. He's making decisions as a coach about everybody else, but then not even talking to other people. Uh, um, famously, the, the unemployment division. When did they learn that all these people would be thrown on unemployment? Well, at the same time, Bashir was announcing that all these people would be thrown on unemployment when he went out there and made that public statement. It was oftentimes him, Dr. Stack, sitting in a room making these decisions, not referencing a single expert from the industry. Clearly, because, you know, that's <laughs> how a lot of these decisions were made. For example, you know, these restaurant decisions, and, and you all know how I feel about that and our our fights against that. But the point is, is this collectivism, this globalism that Bashir is relying on, we're all big one family. We're all team Kentucky. We pulled through it together. That is what he's going to prey upon to get to re-election. And make no mistake, that is what this, this altar to collectivism, that's what I'm calling it, is about. This statue celebrating collectivism that's what it's about because, and of course, if you're going to push forward this idea that you need to give us one or two people or give the, the group of elites, the patriarch, the coach, all the power in order to solve everybody's problems, well, then in a, a something like a pandemic is the timing to do that. And that's what we saw. We saw them taking advantage of, of that situation. We talked about that immensely, of course, on the podcast priorly. The, the point is, is that, um, unveiling this statue this way, once again, we'll show it to you here, um, is, is quite a question. But the other thing here to talk about uh, when it comes to this statue, to this memorial is, well, how do we pay for that? It's paid for by one of Bashir's infamous uh, end around the legislature. I don't want to have to ask for permission to spend money m funds, you know, and he's done this with, of course, he did this with the tornadoes. He did this with the floods where he creates these, these nonprofit accounts of money for you as a citizen to donate money into. Remember in government, the legislature is supposed to be the appropriator. So what he's created is these loophole systems where you donate money 
to it. As a citizen, he convinces you to do it in the case of these emergencies. And then you throw in the money and, uh, and then he has sole control over how it gets doled out, how it gets spent, what's the choices made, because the legislature did not appropriate those funds. What was the net result of that? Well, as we saw with the tornado account, over uh, uh, 200 people um, called in to the government to say, look, I received a check. So, so to rewind for a second, they had this fund that people donate money into, um, including other countries, to uh, Western Kentucky Relief Fund that was ran by the governor, which makes no sense. These are nonprofits. Now, these are tax deductible donations too, by the way, keep that in mind. But anyway, so the, these nonprofits, they, they, their nonprofit uh, accounts ran by the government, but instead of just donating money to the nonprofits that already exist, that are already on the ground. Um, instead, he decided that he needed to be the savior. And so if he just directed you to give money to something like the, uh, the Appalachian uh, relief fund for, or the, the Christian Appalachian projects or, or what have you that do a lot of this flood relief have done it in the past for Kentucky. If you gave money to them, well, that doesn't give an opportunity for Bashir to throw his name on it. I mean, we see what he does. He travels around the state doing these check giving out ceremonies when he's handing out our tax dollars back to us. And it's got to have his name on it, Team Kentucky, his signature on it. And, and like it's his money, like you won the lottery because you're getting back your tax dollars. That is how Bashir operates. So, of course, he's not going to direct people to give money to a nonprofit that he can't get to have control over because then he doesn't get to stand there and say, look what I did for you. Once again, I'm taking care of you. I'm the, the, the patriarch of Team Kentucky. I'm the patriarch of Kentucky, which is, after all, just one big family. And as a patriarch, I'm taking care of you. Look at this money I raised for you. Look at these checks I'm writing to your community. That is how he operates. So he can't do this through normal appropriations. He's going to, of course, have a, a donation sent in that he has control over. And, and as I mentioned with these funds priorly, um, he had 200 people receiving $1,000 checks out of the tornado fund that did not uh, uh, co have any tornado damage. That's $200,000 uh, of money sent out that people are like, I didn't have any damage. I don't know how you got this list. Well, he's got this other fund uh, that he put together for the COVID-19 uh, memorial. And, and that's what put up this here uh, constructed this here memorial with the little Team Kentucky logo and everything else, literally uh, a, a campaign, in a way, a campaign stunt funded through nonprofit donations in order to build an altar to collectivism and to this idea that you have got to this this globalism idea that you have got to vote for your coat your your fatherly patriarchal figure uh who's just he's just trying to, he's just trying to take care of you he wants to take care of all your needs that's who he is he really really cares about you and i'm gonna say something a little controversial you ready I don't want a government who cares about me like that. I want a government who does their job. I don't need you involved in charity. I don't need you to try to take care of me. I don't want it. I want you to make sure people follow the law. And I want you to, on the local level, to come together in order to do things that we all kind of come together on, such as road sewers, those kinds of things, bridges, infrastructure, those things that uh, as a community, we kind of had to come together to do because one individual building it could and then toll it out. There's other options. I hear you, but that's probably the easiest way to do it. But that's a different debate. The point is, is I want you making sure everybody follows the law. And it's treated equally under the law, so that way I have the ability to conduct business without worrying about getting robbed from, stole from, those kinds of things. That's what I want. I don't need you taking care of me. But of course, Bashir wants you to vote for him because he's the one who's taking care of you. That's why this was built. It was built as an altar to Annie Bashir being this patriarchal figure who 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 just wants to hold you real tight and just take care of everything for you all he asks in return is complete and utter loyalty and for you to give up just a few of your basic rights like the right to earn a living or go to church which I think that is a good lead in 
Um, actually, I'm going to go a little bit out of order to uh, my weekly segment, what I did to upset the left this week. And what I did this week was, well, I uh, tweeted this here. Um, simply put, I said, do you hate Christians? No fear. Just vote Amy Bashir for Kentucky governor. He'll throw them in jail. And uh, the responses received to this, um, of course, a lot of people on the right knew exactly what I was talking about and completely understood it. And of course, on the left, the responses were generally uh, things like um, this. Uh, well, first, you had some people uh, saying things like, hey, uh, well, that's where Christians belong. Throw all the Christians in jail, betraying how they actually feel that they do actually hate Christians. Why? Well, simply because Christians won't give you a sign off on your behaviors. Um, they, they, they see to understand this, the left really hates Christians and they really hate Christians for a very basic and simple reason, because they will not celebrate, uh, their behavior. True Christians do not celebrate sinful behaviors. And, the, and sin is defined in the Bible. You can go to whatever New Age church you want to go to um, that will tell you, hey, everything's okay, you do whatever. But quite frankly, that is not what is defined. The, the Bible is very clearly defining what is sinful and what is not. But uh, putting that to the side... Do Christians, do I, I disagree with maybe something you're doing. Do I want to throw you in jail for it? Well, are you harming other people? No. Um, are you harming people under the age of 18? No. If your answer is no to those two things, or are you the under age of under 18 and you're making permanent life altering decisions where you aren't at that stage of your life yet to be able to make those decisions, something we recognize in our society? No. And, 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 if you're outside of that, I don't care what you do. See, here's the difference. And, and I said this last week, I'll say it again. The left has no concept of this idea that I can disagree with you. I can disagree with your lifestyle. I can disagree with your personal decisions. That doesn't mean I want you thrown in jail for them. They cannot deal with it. However, the other way around, if, if, if you disagree with their lifestyle and decisions, they want you thrown in jail for it. If you won't use their pronouns, they want you thrown in jail for being a hate crime. Meanwhile, I don't care what you call yourself. You're not going to control my behavior. But if you want to prance around in whatever you want to prance around in, as long as it's not exposing yourself to minors, whatever, do you. But making me play along with it, that is you deciding uh, uh, you want to control how others think and, and what they believe in. That is what you're showing. But putting that to the side. So you had these, these people saying, oh, Christians belong in jail because, of course, they think we're awful. And then you had a whole lot of people stating that this was a lie. That Andy Bashir doesn't want to throw uh, Christians in jail because they're very forgetful. See, or they're purposely playing very, very dumb. I want to remind you what was specifically said by Bashir, take a look. This is this is from his press conference uh, back in 2020. Uh so we're having to take a, a new action that I hoped uh, that we wouldn't. It's that any individual that's going to participate in a mass gathering of of any type that we know about this weekend, um, we are going to uh, record license plates and provide it to local health departments. The local health departments are going to come to your door. Uh, with an order for you to be quarantined for 14 days. His words were specific. If you go to church, this was over Easter. So if you went to church on Easter in person, you are going to receive a notice saying you are to self-quarantine. Your he, he said this, your license will be wrote down, gave to your health department, then they would come and knock on your door and make sure you self-quarantine. They said the government would enforce a self-quarantine of two weeks if you went to church. That is what was stated in there. He said it. They will force you to self-quarantine. Well, how will they force you? Well, the only way they can force you, the government only can do things in one way at the end of the day, at the end of a gun. That's how government does things. And this, this is something the, the people just have no concept of. Every law, every rule, everything that the government does is enforced at the end of a barrel of a gun. All these anti-gun people, and trust me, I hear from them all the time. You can see the rack on the wall behind me. 
<laughs> they're really upset by the fact that I've got a few of my hunting shotguns, my AR-15, my AR-10 behind me, because I had nowhere else in my office to hang it. My wife wouldn't allow the gun rack in the bedroom, and I ran out of room in my gun safe uh, for the five firearms behind me. But <laughs> putting that to the side, they seem to hate guns when it's owned by a citizen, but they love it to use government violence in order to enforce their wills. Because understand, if the the... Government is forcing you to quarantine. What happens if you don't do it? Well, we saw what happened in Jefferson County. They put uh, uh, tracking anklets around them. Well, what happens if you violated that? What happens if you didn't quarantine? What was going to happen? You'd be thrown in jail. So that is, or if you tried to resist, you could have been shot even. That is what would have happened. But yet, there's no concept of this. They play dumb. No, no, he didn't want to arrest people. He just said you would be forced to be quarantined. The only reason, it never got to a point where Christians were actually thrown in jail was because individuals stood up and sued Andy Bashir in federal court, and they ruled quickly against him that he was violating constitutional rights, that he couldn't shut down churches that way that's the only reason why it didn't get that far but he wanted to do you not think Bashir would have thrown you in jail for ignoring your quarantine he said the government would force you to do it you can miss try to misrepresent what he said you could try to say it's a lie all you want to but you just heard it out of his own mouth forced to quarantine for 14 days forced Force only comes in one way from the government. What would have happened? I mean, I mean, literally. What does the these people who say Andy Bashir didn't want to throw Christians in jail simply for going to church on Easter? What do they think would happen? So you get put under what? House arrest? What happens if I leave? Will the police come and get me and take me back home? How many times until they just throw you in jail? What happens when you violate house arrest normally? You're thrown in jail. Is Andy Bashir going to sit here and pretend like they really had the resources to keep track of every single citizen to stop them? No. We know if he would have been allowed to continue down the road he headed down with that. Forced to quarantine, writing down license plates, the health department will show up at your door. That is what he said show up at your door and force you, that road leads one way, people in jail, or if people resist, dead. By government violence. That's the only way it ends. Yet the left wants to misrepresent this. Because they can't comprehend this. This is the facts of the matter. Our current Kentucky governor wanted government violence against Christians who went to church on Easter. You can dress it up however you want to do it. You can try to tie little bows on it. But that is what the courts found. That is what he did. He is wrong to have done it. He, you can't get over that. You can pretend it didn't happen. But that's what happened. And if you want to endorse that, that makes you just as a horrible of a person as he is. And I and, and as I covered in my first segment, he tries this whole fatherly thing. Fathers don't f- force you under house arrest for going to church. Dictators do. Tyrants do. People who get off on the power. That's who does that. And if you're the kind of person that cheers it on, it makes you just as much as an awful person as he is. But of course, Bashir knows this. That's why he's already on the attack. The Democrat Governors Association, which is um, getting, of course, going to spend a lot of money to... <laughs> push forward um, Annie Bashir into this campaign has released its first ad uh, and it's attacking Cameron or at least it's trying to attach Cameron to uh, Bevan and claiming he's soft on crime of course that would be if you're if you're in the uh, Bashir camp and you're saying look we're gonna have plenty of money what attack lines do we want to use what messages do we want to try to get out there you're gonna lead off with one 
you're 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 going to test the waters on one uh, early on that you are going to try to do and in this case what Bashir is trying to do is he's trying to attach Daniel Cameron to Bevan why because Bashir beat Bevan and so he if he can recreate what happened four years ago well he thinks he stands a really really good chance at re-election however there's concerns here uh thing frankly Cameron isn't Bevan and people know that it's going to be harder than people think to link the two together. Bevan did a few things before the election. Now let's keep in mind, Bashir only won by 5,000 votes against Bevan. The question becomes, has Bashir gained more people, gained more people than Cameron will gain going into this election? Has he gained enough? What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at 2019 results real quick for the governor's race. And then let's look at the attorney general's race in the general. So in the 2019 governor's election, Amy Bashir received right at 709,000 votes, 709,000 votes. Okay. How many votes did Daniel Cameron get that same election year running for attorney general? 823,000. Daniel Cameron running four years ago, same time as Andy Bashir, received over 100,000 <coughs> more votes than Andy Bashir did. So why, what, what, what am I hitting at here? is that Amy Bashir is trying to say, well, people didn't just not vote, didn't just vote for Amy Bashir. They didn't vote for Bevan. And he needs to try to do the same thing. He's got to ask himself a question. One, does 823,000 people turn out to vote for Daniel Cameron? Or more? Probably more because he's topped the ticket. Two, did I gain 120,000 more supporters over the last four years? Did 120,000 people that voted for Bevan, at least, decide that I did such a great job that they're actually going to vote for me instead of Daniel Cameron? I'd say that's a hard road to hoe if you're Annie Bashir, And this is why. Um, Bevan had a lot of issues going into that. He had the issues with Janine Hampton. He had the issues with the Warren County Judge Executive. He had the issues with Toll Bridges. And of course, he had the big one, the issues with the teachers and the pensions and so on and so forth. Daniel Cameron doesn't have that baggage. And so does Annie Bashir think that he's going to be able to get 100,000 more voters that didn't vote for him last time who voted for the other guy who voted for him because he did these things. And now you're running against a person who hasn't done those things. And I'd have to imagine those 700 and some odd thousand voters that, uh, 704, 5,000 voters that Bevan got, they have, I don't think Bashir's moved a single one of them, or if he has, it's very marginal because if you're, we're at that point where you're voting for Bevan four years ago with all those issues, you're not not going to vote for the Republican this time around. I just, I don't see it. You're going to vote for him. You're going to vote for Cameron. Cameron will get 705,000. He will get every vote Bevan did. I believe he will. Now you could say, well, I don't know. Bashir's done a real good job. I know a few people that say, um, you know, that they support Bashir and so on and so forth. And yeah, you do. And maybe they identify as Republicans too. But the question is, did they honestly show up and vote for Bevin four years ago and they regret their vote? Does 125,000 people that voted for Bevin four years ago regret their vote? And will Daniel Cameron hold the same amount of voters he got four years ago? I don't see a reason why he doesn't get those same amount of voters. I don't see why he would. So now you look at, I mean, maybe you could say he's running against Gregory uh, Stumbo. He's running against Stumbo, who was uh, uniquely unlikable uh, four years ago. So you can make that same argument that 
Cameron was running against a more unlikable person four years ago. That's why I got those votes. And I could hear that argument. Let's sit down and talk it out. But I don't think Daniel Cameron's lost ground. So has Andy Bashir gained it. I think it's going to be hard for him to say. So he's got to try to tear votes away from Cameron, uh, I think, no matter what. But at the same time, remind people why they voted for him in the first place. And that was because you had this awful guy, Bevin, who just was mean. Yeah, he told the truth on a lot of issues. You know, you can be mad at him over the toll booths in northern Kentucky, and I understand why, because a lot that is a main point of commerce. But he said, this bridge is failing, and we've got to pay for it somehow, and I, I don't know of another way to pay for it. Because he wasn't planning on the federal government coming in and building the bridge. But that's what ended up happening. And, oh, by the way, did the bridge end up failing within four years after re-election? Yes, it did. It had a catastrophic failure that caused emergency closures and, and, and issues. And they had a Russian federal government, the largest infrastructure project the federal government's ever done for an individual like a state situation like that, Northern Kentucky Bridge Project. Bevin wasn't wrong. Bev said the pension system was going broke. You can not like it, but he wasn't necessarily wrong. It is. And so really the issue was that Bevin was mean, but Bashir's going to try to attach. He's going to try to catch that lightning in a bottle. Is he going to be able to pull it off? Time will tell. Time will tell. We'll see how this race develops. But enough about the governor's race, which has been most of this episode Let's check out this video here from Kelly Kraft. Um, Let's take a look. I have two words to say before I say anything else tonight. They are thank you. It really means so much that you showed up day after day, made sacrifices and supported us no matter what. And I've been humbled by the support. I know that our movement has had lasting impressions on Kentuckians across the Commonwealth. And the Kentuckians that I've met have made a lasting forever impact on me. You have challenged me. You have given me your trust and confidence. And I will never take this for granted. I have looked into the eyes of hardworking, extraordinary, welcoming citizens of our strong state. And my love for Kentucky is strong and everlasting. This movement has just started. And I promise you, I will work hard for you every single day. For those of you listening to the audio only version of that, that um, didn't see at the end, (coughs) at the end of that video, it said, stay tuned. Um, Or the audio only version, sorry, the podcast you didn't see at the end of that, it said, stay tuned. So what is Kelly Kraft thinking about doing here? Is she looking at making a run for something at some point in the future? I think the answer is pretty obviously yes. But what will it be? I think the obvious choice here would be Senate in 2026. McConnell's uh, uh, current term is up in 2026. Will he run again? Well, there's a lot of speculation about what this governor's race means for that. If 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 Bashir wins McConnell does he stay in does he doesn't so so a law was passed two years ago I believe about two years ago that changed how a, a governor selects a replacement for a federal delegation so it used to be that the governor just picked whoever they wanted to for the federal delegation well two years ago a law was passed saying that the party of the person who was in that office in that position uh, if if there's a death or they retire um, and they, they leave office, then the party picks three people, and then the governor decides from those three people who they want as senator. And so, now, the most mcconnell thing in the world to do is to not allow your open seat to go up for actual open, free, ele- fair, completely level uh, uh, playing field. In fact, we know this is not what establishment Republicans do. They hate open primaries hate them with a ever-loving passion 
Take a look at my state senate race two years ago. What'd they do? Well, they redistricted me out of the race. They districted it out. Every opponent, their chosen senator in that race, Amanda Mays Bledsoe, who ended up being the senator, they redistricted out even the Democrat challenger. Every single person that had filed to run for that open 12th seat, uh, they districted out other than their chosen person that they wanted. We see this with uh, Alvarado. He runs for re-election and then almost immediately after being re-elected announces he's stepping down and he's retiring. He's leaving. He's going to Tennessee to be the director of health. We see this with uh, even on the Democrat side. We saw this with the county clerk here in Fayette County. He steps down after winning re-election and then... They pick a a replacement. They don't like open seat elections. They want there to be an incumbency effect no matter what. That's what they want. And so the most McConnelly thing to do in the world is for him to step down so he can handpick his replacement. But he's got to have a governor that's going to pick the people, the person he wants. McConnell's the type where he has a person in mind. And he wants a governor that's going to select that person for him. Now, we know Bashir won't be it. But will Daniel Cameron be it? Well, that leads to a question. Now, Cameron was challenged a lot during the primary of McConnell's man, and he said he was not McConnell's man. But time will tell if after this election is clear and Daniel Cameron is the winner and then McConnell steps down and retires. We know that he feels confident Cameron will pick the person that he wants to take over, which means that Daniel Cameron was McConnell's man. We got it wrong. He tricked everybody because if he wasn't McConnell's man, once again, McConnell wouldn't step down. He wouldn't want to leave it up to chance who ends up being his replacement. Unless McConnell just has three people and he doesn't care which three it is, but that doesn't seem like McConnell to me. That being stated, so if McConnell doesn't step down, does he run for re-election in two years? Better yet, how open is McConnell to being challenged during a primary, especially from somebody like Kraft, who has just as much money to spend in an election like that as McConnell would, because that's how McConnell's kind of always, he, he's, he's politically kind of crushed it. Now, would Kelly, now, now that puts the, the opportunities aside. I think Kelly Kraft could go head to head with McConnell, and I think she could win because a lot of people don't like McConnell. It's not like people would think it's either Kraft or McConnell. If, if it's a closed primary, I don't think other people are going to jump in where you get a lot of other selections like you had during the governor's race. So I think that offers opportunity for her to win. But would she be a good senator? Is she a good candidate? We just saw her spend uh, millions of dollars, probably 12 to 15. We haven't seen the final numbers yet. Millions of dollars to run for governor. And facts of the matter is she did come in third place. But why is that? Can money buy elections? Well, money can to an extent... But also it comes down to messaging. And I'm going to say something here that I don't know if all of you will agree with. But I think Kraft with better messaging could have even won that governor's primary. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there's certain aspects. uh, Now, the question is, does she believe the messaging, right? And what I mean by that is if Kraft had came out and said something similar to what we heard Trump say, which was, yeah, I'm a billionaire. Yeah. I've played the system. I've benefited from the system we currently have. And I've played the game. That's why you should elect me because I've played it. It's wrong. And the fact that I have to deal with this is very, if, if, if Kraft came out and said, it is all these donations, everything you're attacking me for, these donations, this having to get along with all these establishment people, understand this. My family, this is Kraft. If I'm talking as if I'm Kraft. Uh, my family owns energy companies, the most heavily regulated industry in Kentucky is, or or, I'm sorry, not just in Kentucky, the most heavily regulated industry, one of the, in the nation is energy, oil, coal, gas. And if we are not paying out these donations, these legal bribes to these political people, our opponents are doing it instead, and they're going to crush us. The only ability we have to keep our business open is to pay out these legal bribes. It shouldn't be this way. It is wrong, and I'm the type of person who's going to come in and fix it because I understand the problem. I know who the players are, and I recognize it's wrong, and I'm the only person who can't be bought by other people because I don't need their support. That was Trump's message, too, by the way. 
I understand the system. I know it's corrupt. I know it is because I've played in it. And oh, by the way, because I'm a billionaire, I can't be bought. I think that would have been great messaging. And if we see a Senate campaign built around that messaging, and if she means it, that could offer some opportunities. That could. Uh, and you could see a formidable campaign, even if that is an open seat primary. If that's what happens, I think it's it's I think it's clear to me. It appears to me that she's eyeing up that Senate race in two years. Um, whether or not she runs, if it's a McConnell replacement, she may still run. Um, if it's McConnell in that office, I I would put I would almost one hundred percent guarantee she will run to take on McConnell. I believe she believes that McConnell backed Cameron, right, wrong, or indifferent. She believes that, and she's tired, and, and so she feels personally wrong by that. So I think she would also be willing to go after McConnell. But at the same time, um, and then if that goes to an open seat, I think she definitely runs. So if McConnell's still in there or it goes to an open seat, I'm almost 100% positive she runs. Don't quote me on that, but I'm almost 100% positive. If, however... It remains a, a either McConnell steps down and appoints his replacement. I don't know whether or not she runs for that office. Time will only tell. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Hopefully you've enjoyed the show. If you have, please like, comment, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at KY Cooper Rider, and tell others about the show. This stuff, this work we do here to, to kind of cover this, these shows, um, it's important. Also as well, you've made it to the end. We're playing with different times of releasing the show, trying to figure out what timing of the week is best. Last week, we did Wednesday at 10 a.m. This week, we're doing Thursday um, at 7 p.m. Uh, if you have an idea for when you think this show should be released, where you believe most people would watch it, shoot me a message. Maybe we'll try out your time, too, as well. But regardless, thank you all so much for joining me, and have yourselves a wonderful rest of your evening.